Okay, so um, I'm at the University of Illinois. I'm in the College of Education. I'm interested in uh, mostly on the AR and MR uh, spectrum because I care a lot about gesture and I care a lot about movement and I care about connecting and extending and augmenting uh, those um, natural movements that people do when they're thinking about hard problems uh, to... Do I need it? To, Oh yes, recording to um, uh, to uh, to visualizations and to aids to help people think through uh, these these hard problems. Too many things in my hand. Um, so um, it, you know, the nice thing about going after Mina is that you know she did a lot of the work for me in terms of talking about um, embodied learning. Um, I kind of knew that she was going to do that, so I've kept this part pretty short. But basically, it's building off of the idea that you know the 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 mind and the Cognitive processes are so deeply rooted in in our body movements, the way that we act, the way that we we physically engage uh, with the world. And if that's the case, then we really need to build the technologies that 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 elicit action uh, in such a way that they um, that they leverage what we know about our bodies and they take advantage of the the new metaphors and the extensions of uh, our gestures into these new and complicated uh, domains. So, um, and, and so the, uh, there's lots of different spaces where I think you can apply ideas of embodied learning to the design of technologies. For me, I focus mostly in, in these places where you can allow students and children to act out their thinking about a particular uh, idea in STEM so that they can do a gesture uh, to test a hypothesis, to show somebody what it is, how they think uh, something works. So this is an example here of a student um, uh, or a child at a museum who is um, basically acting out his ideas about how objects move in space. And he's playing a game to basically make predictions about where this asteroid is going to go in this field that has gravitational forces. And he's getting feedback from his family and other people in the space as th th they're working through this problem, making very visible, making very physical these ideas um, about, uh, about science. So now I want to talk about um, uh, a current project that I'm working on called GRASP, Gesture Augmented Simulations for Supporting Explanations. So this is a set of uh, laptop-based simulations that use the Leap Motion device to capture students' hand gestures um, when trying to give explanations about science ideas, particularly describing the causal mechanisms of, of critical and everyday scientific phenomena, like the causes of seasons, uh, like gas pressure, really difficult concepts um, that, that kids often have a hard time explaining. But a, a point that I want to make that I think it, that, that hopefully resonates with a lot of these designs is that we didn't start by saying, well, how do we want students to interact with this technology when it comes to movement? We started out by asking, well, how do students move naturally when they are doing productive reasoning, doing productive, making productive explanations of these, these phenomena? So this is an example of Haroon, who uh, we gave him the problem. We said, Haroon, here's a, a metal spoon. We put it in a hot cup of water and we had him touch the handle of the spoon which didn't go into the water but also got hot and we said Haroon why did the handle of the spoon get hot when it didn't come in contact with the with the hot water and he kind of struggled with it he sort of played with these ideas of heat being this sort of this this fluid or this substance that moves through the spoon but we prompted him to, to use his hands, and we prompted him to, to use gestures. And in the course of doing so, he sort of acted out this sort of vibration um, chain reaction uh, scenario where the, the molecules are hitting each other and, uh, and speeding each other up to the point that it reaches all the way down to the, the end of the spoon, making that end of the spoon hot, which is a really good, very close to the canonical explanation of, uh, of heat transfer. Um, uh, I, I, I actually assume that you didn't want to hear about research and so I just have this one slide. But, but the, what we found is that the simple prompt to show me, to, 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 to say, show me you know, what you're thinking. So in the course of kind of struggling with an explanation, getting them to use their hands, to use their bodies, to act out their thinking, has incredibly uh, uh, potent effects when it comes to improving the explanations um, from, uh, from not getting that prompt to being asked to do those things. And I think that, that 
in thinking about the media that we create, we can start to build in opportunities, embed this media with those show me type prompts. It doesn't need to be a person standing next to them saying, show me what you're thinking. We've got sensors and devices now that can elicit those, those, those gestures in a show me type way to create these productive experiences. And that's what we really tried to do with the GRASP simulations was to um, create these uh, to create these simulations. The fairly typical uh, simulations of science phenomena. We worked with the folks at Concord Consortium who already had many of these models built, but we equipped them with the ability to have kids use their hands to act out different parts of the, sim the, the system, essentially embed their hands within the system to try to make a representation of how this works and operate the simulation using their hands. That was the gas pressure simulation. And so you can see it prompts you to put your hands on screen. The important thing to note is that once you actually get your hands on screen and, and you're doing the right thing, the hands go away. So now you're just, you're just controlling the simulation. You're not just watching your hands on screen, you're actually part of this system that you're trying to explain and trying to uh, trying to control. So I want, I want to touch on one other project real quick, which is, is getting a little bigger in terms of body movement, like having people use their full bodies to act out these ideas, and particularly to try to focus on this idea of learning transfer. There's been some great Great, you know, studies showing that for specific topics, getting people to use their bodies to act things out is helpful. But, but we, we, in order for embodied learning to to stick around and be really be a part of the mindset of design, we need to get it to the stage that we can show that that learn that being embodied in one context will help you in other contexts. And I think this is also true in thinking about, you know, if if we create new conventions, new you know embodied conventions for every interface that we create, it's going to be really difficult for people to have that, that transfer. So what we did in this project is to try to create an environment where you could have multiple simulations that were about completely different topics, but they use the same sort of gesture scheme in terms of, of interaction so that they could they could be consistent when, when they were dealing with, say, a simulation of earthquakes, which is what we see here on the left. And here you've got somebody who is doing gestures related to the ideas of scale. And then you've got the same gestures around ideas of scale for uh, an acids and bases simulation. So they're, they're using this idea of, uh, of, of, of manipulating a logarithmic scale to change the quantities in these two different science domains. And what we found is that if you start with this, you know, earthquake simulation and you learn those conventions, you come to the next simulation better equipped to work with the science concepts um, at hand. Um, the last thing is, is I didn't want you to get the idea that I'm violating the under 13 rule. Um, uh, I do actually have another project um, where we're working with preschool kids in science centers. We've got a whole network of science centers where um, myself, Chad Lane, uh, Judy Brown are, um, uh, are, are trying to create a network of being able to understand and interpret the movements that kids do in science museums and to be able to build off of those movements to develop science literacy, interest in science, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just wanted to, to end, if I have a moment, I wanted to end with you know, a, a couple takeaway uh, points for um, children's me media. I think it's really wise to view the movements that we ask um, kids to do you know, as a limited resource. And that's not to say that movement for the sake of, of movement can't be good. Exercise, of course, is good. But it can take, it can be an anxiety inducing and it can take a lot of work to be asked to connect movement, to do movement while also trying to think about hard problems or, or, or show what it is that, that you've learned. So if you're going to do it, it needs to be purposeful and it needs to be, uh, needs to be explicit. And, and a related point is that we have to, you know, we really have to make the actions that we ask people to do is very close to the point that Mina was making. We have to connect them to the learning that we want, the, the learning outcomes, the, the ideas, the principles that we want the students to know. There's too many products out there right now, and God, I hope nobody here is responsible for this one, which is just having people do body movement that is not connected. This is somebody basically answering multiple choice questions about math with their feet. And, and you know, it, I'm sure, 
again, I'm sure, you know, the parents can get some satisfaction that they're moving and not just doing homework problems, but we've got to make it meaningful if we want that learning uh, to be resilient. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much.